Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining this webinar session of the African Ombudsman Research Center in 2023. My name is Shannon Bosch, and I'm the academic leader for research and higher degrees in the School of Law here at the beautiful University of KwaZulu-Natal. I've been given the very pleasant task of delivering today's welcome address. I would like to start by acknowledging the Acting Chairperson of the African Ombudsman Research Centre Board and the Acting Public Protector of South Africa, Advocate Malaka. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to our esteemed panel, comprising Dr Hicks, who is a Senior Lecturer in the School of Law here at UKZN, the Ombudswoman for the Seychelles, the Honourable Tirant Gerardi, who will also be facilitating our proceedings this morning, the Ombudswoman woman of Cyprus, the Honorable Stiliano Lotidis, and the Ombudswoman of Malawi, the Honorable Tikambenje Malera. Greetings to excellencies and honorable Ombudsmen and women who are able to join us, distinguished participants and guests, all colleagues, students, our alumni, and members of the media. I welcome you to our webinar session under the theme, Addressing Gender-Based Violence and Harassment, the Ombudsman's Role in Ensuring Women's Safety and Empowerment. Our webinar on this morning of the 29th of August, 2023, has a special significance as it coincides with Women's Month here in South Africa, and it resonates with the mandate of the African Ombudsman Institute to promote the rule of law and to advocate, advocate for human rights. The United Nations set an ambitious target under the fifth sustainable development goal to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls by 2030. Sadly, the news headlines remind us daily how we are failing to protect our mothers, our grandmothers, our sisters and our daughters. We are also not doing enough to empower and give a voice to their stories. Today, I'm delighted to note that our participants represent 47 countries, in fact. As members of AOMA, we need to continue to hold our governments accountable to address the causes and the environments that facilitate the perpetuation of gender-based violence. It is with much pride that our webinar is anchored today by a distinguished and expert panel of our female colleagues who have all proven themselves as visionary leaders in the legal fraternity in Africa and abroad. Who better to discuss the Ombudsman's role in ensuring women's safety and empowerment and to promote capacity development knowledge generation and professionalism within the African Ombudsman's institutions than these four lovely ladies. I'm hopeful that today's webinar will contribute to the development of skilled resources within the Ombudsman institutions and that it will benefit each participating country and Africa as a whole in addressing gender-based violence and harassment. I once again welcome you to this webinar session of the African Ombudsman Research Center in 2023. And I, it is my pleasure to hand over to Advocate Kaleka, who will now formally welcome you as the acting chairperson of the African Ombudsman Research Center Board. Thank you very much.
Perhaps Thank in you. her absence, I can hand over to our facilitator for today. Thank you. The Thank, you very much, Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for those uh, encouraging words as we start this um, this webinar this afternoon. Uh, Frankie, are you in a position to tell us if uh, Dr. Galeka is um, is available? The Honorable Galeka, sorry. Uh, she's among the participants, but I'm looking at upgrading her. I'm looking for her name. So she's among okay. the participants. But yeah, just give me a second. Let me see if I can locate her. Thank you. Marlon, please help me look for APP and upgrade her. Uh, right. In the meantime, I'd like to welcome all the um, the participants that I see are coming from uh, the world over, and uh, welcome welcome to you all this afternoon. Uh, we hope that this will be an inspiring session, and that we can have everybody um, actively uh, involved in the in the process. I would also like to stress that in order to get as much as we can into the session, um, please make every effort to be as concise and uh, as um, as fast as possible so we get uh, all the all the parties um, fully involved in the process so do try to keep to the time uh, the time frames that we've allocated and I will try to be very draconian as well in in timekeeping that said Frankie if uh, if Honorable Guleka is uh, is is not available yet, I perhaps could start. Yes, yes, just start, then we'll give her the opportunity yes, to so give we... the welcoming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And then she can she can just uh, jump in. Um, again, I'd like to I'd like to welcome all all the parties, everybody around the world who's joined us. And I see we've got uh, we've got participants from numerous countries um, in Africa, as well as in other parts of the world. Uh, I would very much like to uh, start off with the, with the purpose of this, uh, of, of this webinar, which is to literally bring together experts and stakeholders to encourage insightful conversations, share best practices, and promote collaboration to enhance existing policies the policies that raise awareness and understanding of legal mechanisms and the ombudsman's role, as well as prevention strategies against gender-based violence and harassment. Gender-based violence, it is universally recognized and acknowledged, is what is needed for societal peace. And societal peace will be unattainable where there is gender-based violence and harassment. It is in the talk we talk, we recognize it in the knowledge we have, it is fully addressed in the action we take or so. That is the question we need to ask ourselves. Although we know for now, we know much more about gender-based violence and harassment, we most certainly talk more about it and we may collectively and individually do much more about it. We must ask ourselves, why is it that it continues to hold back many parts of our modern world, impoverishing many segments of our societies. And we recognize that gender-based violence and harassment sets back so much of our potential for development and achievement of those sustainable goals that humanity has set itself. To quote from Mrs. Roberta Clark, Regional Director of the UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific in 2015, human society will never know peace as long as women, one half of humanity, remain vulnerable to violations and limitations of choice, whether in the home, in the community, or at the instance of those who wield the powers of state. In her address at the launch of the 16 Days of Activism in 2015, Mrs. Clark told UN Women Asia Pacific participants that the full empowerment of women and gender equality was the silver bullet 
to achieve development goals. If you can ensure that women are equal participants in development, you will have far higher national development results. If women are fully economically and socially empowered, are able to make choices about their lives and emerge as leaders in large numbers, this will be critical for development. If people are left behind and women represent roughly 50% of the population, a country will never achieve its full potential. This has to be seen not as among which is useful, but as something that is essential to have women fully empowered and enjoying equal rights it's the right thing to do, and it's the smart thing to do for development. There can be no dispute that ending impunity for all forms of violence against women is a precondition for the rule of law and for women's access to justice. And the Ombudsman has a unique entry point in this objective as monitors of state administration. The Ombudsman is a catalyst for redress, of citizens whose rights have been impugned through state action, inefficiency, or indifference. The Ombudsman has access to the parliamentary processes and therefore has the ability of making visible and therefore political and legitimate expectations of fairness, efficiency, and responsiveness of state actors. The Ombudsman has a strong moral voice, is seen as independent, authoritative, with defined jurisdiction and defined powers, is accessible and therefore influential. The Ombudsman can help civil society organizations transform culture and build political will to attain zero tolerance to violence against women. How? By working with government agencies and women organizations to determine and address patterns of injustice based on inefficient and unfair administrative procedures and practices. Of course, the battle is not an easy one. With such a high prevalence of, of gender-based violence and harassment, and the scale of deficits in the administration of justice, the Ombudsman's capacity to respond effectively with the office's limited and insufficient resources will, be put, it, will put its resolve to the test. Sorry. That is where the focus of this seminar could lie. This is where the honorable speakers will assist us in reflecting on this theory subject with a view to finding the, the answers and the help that we, that we'll, we will need in the process, for there can be no dispute that the Ombudsman is a powerful ally to all citizens seeking redress. The Ombudsman is equipped to draw attention to the magnitude of the problem of gender-based violence and harassment, and at the same time, leverage the officer's constitutionally guaranteed access to parliament so that the legislature can pass the necessary legislation and do the needful to address those barriers to justice that so many survivors of gender-based violence and harassment are faced with. On that note, I, I will take the matter now to the next speaker. Um, uh, do we uh, have uh, a... Oh, no, Nicole, Advocate Koleka yes. is us. She's, she, she can give us a welcome. Then I'm, I apologize. I welcome, I welcome Honorable uh, Galeka. And, uh, and I'd like to apologize for having, for having um, barged in on her, I would like to invite her now to make her presentation welcome address. Thank you. Very good morning. Uh, let me greet um, the protocol is already established. I will not uh, waste any much time by uh, acknowledging protocol. I acknowledge everybody. Thank you to the facilitator, AOC, UKZN, and our partners throughout the globe for your support each time we have these webinars to try and keep ourselves abreast of issues happening around us um, as the ombudsman institutions, particularly in Africa. But I have with great pride learned how our colleagues throughout the globe look forward to these webinars each and every time we have them. Hence, we cannot fail. We need to ensure that despite the challenges that we face as IELTS, we continue this workshopping and education. 
taking a quote uh, by Roberta Clark, the regional director of the United Nations Women Regional Office for Asia in the Pacific, I wish to quote that, there can be no sustainable peace where women are vulnerable as we have seen throughout history and across cultures to violations and to limitations of choice and autonomy, whether in the home, in the community, or at the instance of those who wield the powers of the state. I unquote, violence against women in girls is a global scourge of pandemic proportions. At least one out of every three women around the world has been beaten, coerced into sexual acts or otherwise abused in their lifetime. With the abuser usually someone known to her, that it is perhaps the most pervasive human rights violation that we know today. It devastates lives, fractures communities and impedes development. We cannot speak of women development and women emancipation whilst we still have the scourge of gender-based violence. Despite its progressive constitution and laws against gender-based violence, our country, for instance, is amongst the highest rates of such violence in the world. Studies by the Medical Research Council suggest that only one in nine rape cases are reported in our country. More than 2.5 million crimes are reported annually, and every citizen currently stands a one in 19 chance of being a victim of a criminal act. Domestic violence is considered the most underreported crime, and it is also believed to be the most common category of violence, according to the South African Stress and Health Survey conducted by Johns Hopkins University and the University of Cape Town. Such violence was reported by about one in eight women in the study and 1.3%. And South Africa's chief legal response to domestic violence is the Domestic Violence Act, which is also referred to in the Firearms Control Act of 2000. Figures show that um, the number of applications, for instance, for protection orders in our country total about 668,875. Some of the reasons for the state of affairs are well known and have been captured uh, and are well documented. Poor education is a means that children, female children cannot advance in life and may after marriage become dependent on their spouses for survival. Financial dependency is another risk factor for domestic violence in relationships. Lack of community participation, erosion of social control institutions, influence and ineffective criminal justice system. And by the way, let me also state that as the Office of the Public Protector in South Africa, we are busy with, an, with a systemic investigation looking into the impediments within our criminal justice system which perpetuate gender-based violence and also into the Maintenance Act and its system because those are two important tools that lead um, to gender-based violence if not uh, properly addressed. We find that in most instances, the victims are attacked by perpetrators which are known to them and uh, are very close to them, which makes the situation more difficult um, for the victim of these particular crimes. Now, as the public protector, we've outlined our role, not limited to receiving and reviewing complaints about the actions and omissions of government departments, agencies, employees, laws, and policies in dealing with gender-based violence, referring victims and support services uh, to programs that are required, providing information about the services and programs available through the government, taking remedial action to influence government in a particular administration to be proactive in assistance, regularly and actively monitoring the developments of particular cases under investigation. We as a public protector have also contributed to the victims charter in our country to ensure that victims of violence, particularly gender-based violence, are being protected. But most importantly, um, as it once be mentioned that when we speak of gender-based violence, we highlight the victims. We've got so many victims, and these are the victims. But I think in, 
we need to change the narrative in this regard and say, who are the perpetrators? Let us name and shame the perpetrators so that the perpetrators are actually known in our communities. It is the perpetrators who are not known in our communities that, for instance, in my view, covers the face of those who are at the helm of the commitment of these crimes. It is critical that um, as ombudsman community, we really look very closely at our role in dealing with gender-based violence, assisting, uh, supporting the system and assisting with these deficiencies in the system, which are systemic. That is the only way in my view that we can ultimately as a globe eradicate and combat violence against women and children and ultimately realize their rights to freedom, their rights to dignity, their rights to life, their rights equal and equitable to that of our male counterparts. With that said, I'd like to welcome you and wish you fruitful deliberations as always. And I know that this will be uh, our institutional memory as ombudsman, which will serve as a footprint for those who come after us. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Kaleka. Um, and thank you for those um, wise words and uh, thoughts for uh, the process as we start this uh, seminar, this webinar. And um, we will move now to the first uh, speaker. Uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Janine Hicks, who will talk to us about legal frameworks and policies to counter, based, to counter gender based violence and harassment. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Janine Hicks uh, is a senior lecturer at the, law, at the School of Law, where she serves as a convener for the Navi Pillay Research Interest Group and chairperson of the uh, University of KwaZulu Natal's uh, Gender Based Violence Committee. She is the coordinator for street law and, and lectures on Master of Laws offerings on constitutional litigation and employment discrimination legislation. Dr. Hicks holds a PhD and an LLB from the University of KwaZulu-Natal and a Master of Arts in Development Studies from the University of Sussex of the United Kingdom. Dr. Hicks is the project leader for the South African Law Reform Commission's Project 143 on maternity and paternity benefits for self-employed workers and a council member of the state's Human Resource Development Council. Her research interests are in informative constitutionalism, access to justice and equality jurisprudence. Before joining the School of Law in 2017, Dr. Hicks worked from the early 1990s in the non-governmental non organization human rights sector, thereafter serving two terms as commissioner with the Commission for Gender Equality, one of South Africa's constitutional institutions supporting democracy. Welcome Dr. Dr. Hicks and please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Nicole Thiron Gerardi, and um, greetings to colleagues, Honorable Palega. It's great to be on the panel with you again, Professor Bosch from our School of Law, Honorable members of IOMA and AOC, um, and just everyone who's with us this morning. I have been asked to speak to the legal frameworks and policies um, that we have in place that can be used to combat gender based violence and harassment. And noting, obviously, that we come from many of the countries of, on the continent, I thought it would be most useful to frame my input by speaking to those international and regional instruments um, to which probably all of our countries are signatory, the majority of our countries are signatory, and really the legal bar or standard that has been set by these international instruments um, for us to assess the extent to which our countries have enacted necessary legislation and policy to give effect to their obligations in international law um, and to address the scourge of gender-based violence and eradicate discrimination within their own countries. Um, and I will use the South Africa really just as a, a little case study, as it were, uh, to demonstrate how countries might um, give effect to those international obligations. 
So there's a starting point, and, and I, I use this because um, when we look at some of our um, international frameworks and obligations, one of the starting points is that countries are obliged to define violence against women in accordance with international norms and standards. And the bar that is set is this, the UN Declaration. Um, and I've, I've shared a link with you um, on how this has been framed by this instrument. So I'm just going to move this up the way so I can see. Right, so violence against women, and you'll note, first of all, um, just to interrupt myself, many of these instruments um, and treaties from the 90s don't speak to gender-based violence um, so much as speaking about violence against women, but I will use those terms interchangeably as that is how we are. we address this now globally. So violence against women is defined as any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering to women, including threats of acts of harm or coercion or arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether in the public or the private space, and whether perpetrated by the state or by private actors within the home, in the workplace, in the home, um, within the community. When we're talking about understanding gender-based violence and the kinds of instances or forms that states are obliged to be addressing and eradicating. These range from the various instances of intimate partner violence, femicide, the killing of women by their partners, sexual violence within conflict situations um, and non-conflict situations, trafficking, honor crimes, um, fe female genital mutilation, forced and early child marriage, sexual harassment. Um, and while typically we acknowledge that men and increasingly boys are vulnerable to and can be victims of gender-based violence um, as well, our statistics and our narratives and the case studies and the bitter experience at a country level indicates that it is primarily women and girls and increasingly gender non-conforming people um, and those in our LGBTIQ um, sector who face multiple forms of discrimination and are vulnerable to increased risks of violence. Our two prior speakers have spoken about the implications and the impact that gender-based violence has on mental, physical well-being, on um, economic participation, on the ability of women to contribute and participate in their country's development and in their economy, um, and the cost that this has for families, communities, um, and society. So I thought the starting point would be to build from the Beijing Platform for Action. Um, as you know, this was adopted at the UN Fourth World Conference on Women that was in um, held in Beijing, China. Um, and the Platform for Action that ensued from that um, still spells out very specifically a set of strategic objectives. And I think critically for us, a set of specific um, obligations and actions that states can take. While I go through these colleagues, I think it would be worthwhile for each of us to take mental note and assess the extent to which we believe our countries have adopted these kinds of measures. So these are the objectives um, that our countries are obliged um, to implement being signatories to the Beijing Platform for Action. As a starting point to take integrated measures to prevent and eliminate violence against women. You'll see there the framing of violence against women. So measures to prevent it in the first place and eliminate it from our society. Related to that colleague strategic objective D2 is to study what are the causes? What are those fundamental gendered norms um, and patterns within our societies, our cultures, our religions, our patriarchies that cause um, violence against women and how does that manifest? What impact does that have within our community? And the extent to which the measures that we have in place currently are being effective in eradicating those causes and addressing those consequences. So far reaching objectives um, there. And the third objective being to eliminate trafficking in women and to assist victims of violence. So if we start with those three as the key objectives, the Beijing Platform for Action is a very useful document in that it's, it spells out legal responses that countries can adopt. So again, I'd like you to think 
about whether your country um, has adopted such measures. So countries are required, first of all, to condemn violence against women within their countries. And importantly, to refrain from invoking excuses, refrain from invoking context and saying, well, within our custom or within our tradition or within our religion, countries are obliged to condemn all forms of violence against women um, and are obliged to adopt measures to give effect to their obligations in terms of that UN declaration that I read out in the beginning. Countries are also obliged to exercise due diligence in preventing violence against women, in investigating instances of violence against women, and to ensure that they give effect to their own national legislation to punish acts of violence against women. Our statistics tell us that the impunity for gender-based violence, the fact that people can get away with it, is one of the driving factors um, that leads to the perpetuation of gender-based violence. So we condemn it, we take measures to prevent it, we have to ensure that we're implementing our national legislation. Importantly, to end this impunity for gender-based violence, countries are obliged to enact sanctions or where they have such legislation and sanctions in place, ensure that these are reinforced um, through domestic legislation to punish um, and redress harm occasioned to women and girls subjected to any form of violence, whether that's public or private forms. Um, states are obliged also to review and analyze their legislation and say, how effective has this been? Um, and you will see from the, um, the overview that I give you, South Africa, for instance, has adopted a significant number of pieces of legislation. Um, but as our colleagues and Honorable Tailega has um, spelt out with the very low levels of reporting and conviction, um, South Africa clearly should be reviewing and analyzing our existing legislative framework um, to answer that question, why is it not being effective in eliminating violence against women? Um, how is this not bringing about a prevention of violence in the first place? And why do we have such low levels of prosecution? The Beijing Platform for Action in this article goes on to require states to take measures to protect women who've been subjected to violence and ensure that they've got access to remedial measures. Um, so where instances of violence do take place, are those women able to come through and report them? Have they got access to courts um, and other um, remedial measures um, to ensure that they can access compensation, access their necessary healing, psychosocial support, um, as well as um, measures to bring about the rehabilitation of perpetrators. The Beijing Platform of Action, of course, one of its key um, um, strategies is to implement um, the process of gender mainstreaming. Um, that, and the requirement is that states should be mainstreaming all policies and programs that speak to violence against women. Um, and there is a call for research and knowledge building around these causal factors, the consequences, um, and ensure that we've got necessary training in place for enforcement officers, police personnel, um, and other stakeholders, particularly those who deal with vulnerable population groups, such as minorities, um, foreign nationals, migrants, and refugees. Um, and we also, Advocate Falega and um, Honorable Nicole, we're, we're talking about taking measures and steps to address systemic patterns um, of violence against women um, and to ensure that our justice system does not perpetuate that through the re-victimization of women victims of violence. Interesting colleagues, because in our regional um, instruments, uh, you'll notice that our um, Maputo protocol speaks about this obligation. And I, I think this would be something that would be worthwhile taking up in our discussion is, you know, we can adopt and enact all forms of legislation and policy um, to eradicate gender-based violence. But at the heart of that, if we're looking at gendered norms, um, gender inequality, um, and the status of women in society, those kinds of factors that enable gender-based violence to take place, states, and I'd like you to consider what this might look like, states are obliged to modify, take measures, especially in education, 
to modify social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women, to eliminate prejudice, customary, and all other practices that are based in these notions of the inferiority or superiority of either of the sexes um, that perpetuate these stereotypical roles. So we're, states are required to modify behaviors and attitudes and prejudice um, that are based on these notions of um, superiority of men within our, our social um, strata. Um, states are obliged to ensure that our reporting mechanisms are accessible, are safe, are confidential, um, and that women have confidence in these. Um, and there, of course, are recommendations towards the training of police. So a far-ranging and high standard has been set for countries who signatory to the Beijing Platform for Action to adopt legislative and other measures to give effect to these obligations. CEDAW and this colleagues, um, this is our convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. Um, and this is significant and within the literature and the theoretical understanding of gender, gender inequality and gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is recognized and defined as a form of gender discrimination, um, which is why gender-based violence and acts of domestic violence, sexual harassment, et cetera, are coined and recognized as forms of unfair discrimination on the basis of gender, um, which renders it then falling foul of country um, obligations and commitments to equality. So gender-based violence is recognized internationally as a form of discrimination. It's an unfair and an unlawful and an unconstitutional discrimination against women on the basis of sex. Um, and there we have it very clearly um, outlined and defined within CEDAW, and you will see how this comes through in, in South African legislation. So gender-based violence is a form of gender discrimination and should be treated as such. I thought this was useful as well. UN Women um, has outlined, and I've put the link there for those of you who are interested in this. You will know that countries are, it's recommended that countries adopt national action plans that give effect to their obligations to eradicate and respond to gender-based violence and violence against women and girls. And UN Women again has set the bar um, and set out um, a series of criteria and, and components that countries should adhere to in the formulation of their national action plans. Okay, so as a starting point, countries should acknowledge that gender-based violence, um, as our speakers have indicated already, is a violation of human rights. We taking up issue with gender-based violence and we seeking to eradicate it, not because we feel sorry for women and not because women and girls are vulnerable and they deserve protection. Um, those are all obviously sound enough reasons in and of their own. But gender-based violence is a violation of human rights and gender-based violence is a form of discrimination. And as countries that have set out to uphold and protect and ensure the implementation of, and the promotion of human rights, we need to, as countries, take action against gender-based violence. So first of all, acknowledge that gender-based violence is a violation of human rights. Secondly, countries in their national action plans should define what is violence against women in accordance with those international norms. Um, and I shared with you the, the UN um, definition in that regard. Thirdly, to acknowledge that violence against women is a form of discrimination um, and that it is a manifestation and is caused ultimately by this, these historic patriarchal unequal power relations between men and women. Fourthly, countries are obliged to recognize the multiple forms that violence against women take. And of course, um, those of us in the sector are very familiar with this concept of the intersectionalities, how these intersecting um, forms of discrimination and inequality um, come together in a devastating way to reinforce and perpetuate and aggravate forms of violence against women. So not only are you being discriminated against and being subjected to forms of violence merely because you're a woman, but if this is aggravated and amplified by your race, your color, your religion, your sexual orientation, your HIV status, whether or not you're a migrant or a refugee, your age, your disability, 
um, these are recognized as, um, as contributing to the aggravation and the impact of gender-based violence. So countries are obliged to recognize, recognize that and then tailor um, and adjust their strategies and actions um, so that we don't have a one-size-fits-all kind of response to gender-based violence in our country, but we recognizing and responding to um, these nuanced elements that groups um, are facing. Um, fifthly, national action plans should give effect to state obligations in accordance with these various human rights treaties. So I've already shared with you in terms of CEDAW and Beijing, and I'm going to move on next to look at a regional um, slate of obligations. So our national action plans must give effect to our obligations and the various pillars um, in our national action plan should speak to those obligations. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, interestingly, these last two points, national action plans should respond to and draw on this research that the Beijing Platform of Action called for. What are the root causes of gender-based violence? And remember, we pinned at the heart of causes of gender-based violence is gender inequality, gender discrimination, and the unequal social, social statuses accorded to men and women because of gendered norms and prejudice and stereotypes within our societies. Um, and National Action Plan should also, um, there's an information management in terms of data and research um, in relation to the nature of gender-based violence, the prevalence, what is the extent of gender-based violence within the country and the kind of impact that this has um, so that our future work and our assessment of the effectiveness of our programs and policies um, can be addressed. Um, gender-based violence not only taking place obviously within the home and within the community, but gender-based violence and gendered norms and gendered prejudice and stereotypes, of course, follows us into the world of work. Um, and importantly, a most recent convention adopted by the ILO, International Labour Organization, is condemning and speaking to the eradication of all forms of violence and harassment in the world of work. Um, defining what is violence and harassment is a range of unacceptable behaviors in the workplace that can result in physical, psychological, sexual, or economic harm. And the ILO has specifically, specifically stipulated that violence and harassment in the world of work includes gender-based violence and gender-based harassment um, directed at persons because of their sex or their gender. So that could be violence and harassment directed at a person because they're lesbian, because they're gender non-conforming, because they're women, um, and it includes sexual harassment. Um, so in addition to the obligations that I've already given reference to, the ILO requires each member state as part of a consultative process to adopt an inclusive, integrated, and gender responsive approach to prevent and eliminate violence and harassment in the world of work. Um, and states have to adopt measures to prevent violence har and harassment in the world of work um, and ensure that they've adopted appropriate measures to monitor um, how those are being implemented to ensure that we've got appropriate reporting mechanisms for people in the workplace to report sexual harassment or gender-based violence um, and have adequate dispute resolution um, and, and justiciable mechanisms available for people to report and secure redress um, and sanctions for gender-based violence in the workplace. Dr. Higgs, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, would you be able to, to um, wrap up, please? Uh, because we're running over time now. Okay, great, wonderful. I will, wonderful. I will end then with reference to our Maputo Protocol um which um is wonderful because this is we see leadership from the continent um this is on the rights of women in africa um and obligations very specifically if you have a look at the articles um and the obligations placed on state leaders um requiring state parties in terms of article 2 to combat all forms of discrimination against women so there's that recognition that gender-based violence is rooted in gender discrimination. And so all countries on the African continent are obliged to combat forms of discrimination against women. And there I've highlighted in red my favorite um, article within this 
Protocol Article 2, um, which you can see echoes of that Beijing obligation on states. State parties shall commit themselves to modify social and cultural patterns of conduct of women and men. Um, public education, information, education, to eliminate harmful cultural and traditional practices based on those gendered social norms. Um, so I will leave it there. Um, I'm hoping in conversation space, we can I can bring in more information on examples of how the um, domestication of these um, obligations, what this might look like in terms of national legislation. But of course, the overriding um, challenge to us all, um, Honorable Chairperson, is how do we take this legislative framework at the international and at the domestic level um, and ensure that it is implemented in a meaningful way um, so that we are, in fact, preventing and eradicating gender-based violence? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hicks, for a very insightful presentation. And, uh, and, and thank you for having literally um, set the stage for us. Uh, it gives us a lot. I don't want to uh, try to, I think you have uh, brought your points together very nicely, very neatly um, in, in the process. And I don't want to repeat much of what you've said, other than to point out that um, the framework is there. It's just a matter of going home and sitting down and doing the homework now. And I think this is a very good place to start for all of us. We can take, take this exercise literally um, from this point on and bring it home and, and start to see where are we uh, literally take an audit and, and decide, uh, determine where we are in the, in the scale of these international obligations we've all taken. I think that wraps up uh, what you've said um, very neatly. Thank you very much, Dr. Hicks. And uh, we will now move to the next speaker. Again, I, I, um, I will ask the speakers to keep uh, to keep an, an eye on on the clock because um, we will run out run out of time. I would like to invite uh, Honourable uh, Maria Stiliano Lutides. I apologize apologize for any errors in in the pronunciation. Um, the Honourable Ombudsman of Cyprus, who will offer us insights into the Ombudsman's vigilant role in investigating and confronting gender-based violence and harassment. Uh, Dr. Uh, Honourable Maria Stiliano Lotides, a prominent figure from Cyprus, currently holds the position of Commissioner for Administration and the Protection of Human Rights, the equivalent, obviously, of Ombudsman in Cyprus. She was initially appointed in 2017 and reappointed in 2023. So congratulations on your reappointment. Uh, Thank Honourable. you. She also serves on the management board of the FRA, the European Un Union Agency for Fundamental Rights since July, 2020. She is a member of the board of directors of the Association of Mediterranean Ombudsmen. She earned her law degree from the national and Capodistrian University of Athens in 1997. And subsequently, she succeeded in the Pan Cypriot, Cypriot sorry, Bar Association examination, establishing as herself as an active member of the Cyprus Bar Association. In 2009, she obtained an LLM in European Union law from Leicester University, focusing on protection of human rights in the European Union. Maria has held various positions, including advocate barrister, lawyer counselor at the, office of, at the Office of the Attorney General, and the Commissioner for Administration and Human Rights Protection. Her leadership is evident in her oversight of the equality body, Cyprus NHRI, and important mechanisms responsible for monitoring human rights and UN conventions. She has also been a driving force behind significant initiatives such as the National Mechanism Against Torture and Independent Mechanism for Forced Returns. Her membership, membership of organizations like the IOI Europe, ENO, Equinet, and ENNHRI showcase her global commitment to advancing human rights. Honorable Stiliano Lotides, I invite you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, well, when in two, uh, 2017, a new report by the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, FRA, 
presented results from the world's biggest ever survey on violence against women revealed the extent of abuse suffered by women at home, work, in public and online. Fraud director said, this survey figures simply cannot and should not be ignored. Fraud surveys shows that physical, sexual, and psychological violence against women is an extensive human rights abuse in all EU member states. The, norm the normity of the problem is proof that violence against women does not just impact a few women only, it impacts on society every day. Therefore, policymakers, civil society, and frontline workers need to review measures to tackle all forms of violence against women, no matter where it takes place. Measures tackling violence against women need to be taken to a new level now. It is true that both in international and national level, there are significant norms and standards that hold governments accountable for gender-based violence in private and in public, and you require them to take concrete steps to protect, respect, and fulfill women's rights to, to lives free of violence. In 2011, the adoption of, by the Council of Europe of the Istanbul Convention has been a milestone development in this respect and has had a great impact of, of the elaboration of new laws, policies, and practices to address all forms of gender violence. As well <clears throat> as that gender-based violence and harassment remains a taboo subject and, and as a result, there is a silence and underreporting on the issue. Ombudsman and national human rights institutions are independent state institutions mandated with the promotion and protection of human rights, including women rights in and by their own countries. Through their continuous engagement with their relevant actors on the, at the national, regional, and international level, they are in the, an ideal position to contribute to the development of laws, policies, and practices to, to protect human rights, and especially for those people who find this, themselves in a situation of vulnerability. Victims of violations of gender-based violence are among the most vulnerable groups of the population, and they expect from our institutions to respond to their experiences of maladministration, inefficiency, or interference of the part of the police, social services, and other actors in the administration of justice. And it is true that the Ombudsman institutions have a unique entry point as monitors of state administration and as a catalyst of redress for citizens whose rights have been impugned. Furthermore, the Ombudsman has also access to the, to the parliamentary processes and the media, and therefore the possibility of making visible and therefore political citizens legitimate expectations of fairness, efficiency, and responsiveness of state actors. More particularly, the Ombudsman can use some of of his or her existing mandates and functions, such as receive and review complaints about the actions and or omissions of the government, government departments, agencies, employees, laws, or policies, refer victims to programs and services and as appropriate, and provide guidance about the rights of victims and about the services and programs available through the government or NGOs make recommendations to the government or how to change its policies or laws to, to, to better suit the needs and concerns of the victims. Promote public awareness of gender equality and the obligation of the eliminated violence against women and girls. Disseminate information through training and of relevant actors. Collect information and data by, by way of visits to institutions and analyze how to deal with the treatment of women in particular in special groups such as prisoners. Prepare reports on specific areas of abuse which needs urgent and immediate redress and try to have the matter prioritized. I will try now to give you some examples through the experience and work of my office during the last years. The Cyprus Commissioner of Administration, Ombudsman, and the Protection of Human Rights has been provided with broad mandate of protecting promoting and guaranteeing human rights as national human rights institution, as well as promoting gender equality and non-discrimination as an equality body. 
In several occasions, we have used our white power spots to ensure awareness of the gendered nature of the different forms of violence against women and to monitor the implementation and coordination of measures and policies to combat violence against women. In addition, we fulfill our mission to guarantee and to promote gender equality and to fight against any form of discrimination and inequality based on gender in all aspects of life through advocacy and raise the awareness on the necessity of the, for the development and implementation of an adequate legal framework, appropriate structures, strategies, instruments, and actions. More particularly, a number of reports were issued by our office regarding the de deficiencies of the framework for combating domestic violence, sexual violence and stalking, as well as the absence of a, an effective mechanism for timely and coordinated interagency, interagency intervention in cases of serious risk of violence against women. Furthermore, our office has carried out several education and training activities on the issues for, of gender equality and gender-based violence, while it strongly encouraged at first the, the ratification of Istanbul Convention by our country and thereafter its effective implementation. A noteworthy report submitted by my office in November 2019 concerned a suicide committed, a suicide committed by a 14 years old boy in Nicosia. From our investigation, we concluded that law enforcement officers had failed to carry out a risk assessment on the teen's family, despite complaints by the teen's mother who had told police multiple times she was a victim of domestic violence. The report said Social, social services failed to act or coordinate properly following an attempt suicide by the teen, while two social workers were singled out of their election of duty. Furthermore, it was found that no complaint had been filed with the police, even though the police had knowledge of, of at least 20 references of domestic violence in the family. And as a result, we indicated that police officers violated the applicable protocol by failing to alert social services. According to our findings, although there are protocols and procedures in force for protecting victims of domestic violence, lack of, or lack of cooperation between competent authorities and deficiencies in the way that professionals carry out their duties may result in an, ad in an adequate protection. It is our opinion that these deficiencies apply also in other forms of gender violence, such as handling of rape incidents and stalking. The Attorney General of the Republic adopt, adopted my observations and suggestions and proceeded with the criminal charges, not only against the father of domestic violence, but also against the officers of the police and the welfare services who, who were found to have, to have exercised their duties negligently. That was the first time that a criminal case was brought before the court after a report having been submitted by the Ombudsman. Regarding now the sexual harassment in the workplace, in 2018, my office drafted a code of contact to prevent and deal with sexual harassment within the civil service, which was adopted by the Council of Ministers and has become obligatory through, throughout the public sector. The code, provides practical guidance aiming at securing appropriate procedures to deal with sexual harassment and harassment incidents through prevention, but also through repression. This is a useful manual for the creation of working environment that emphasizes the gender equality principles and respect of human dignity while, while uplifting any discrimination of the on the basis of gender. One year later, the main employers in the Industrial Federation of our country signed a similar code of conduct for sexual harassment in the workplace with a view to incorporate, to incorporate it into collective labor agreements for the first time. The code aims to, at preventing and effectively tackling unacceptable behaviors which create an unpleasant work environment that affects human dignity and disrupts the smooth operation of the company. Furthermore, in the beginning of 2021, 
Our office carried out an awareness campaign for harassment and sexual harassment in the workplace under its mandate as a quality body within the 30 years since the establishment of the institution in Cyprus. In this context, our office has cooperated with several organizations such as Cyprus Theatre Organization, Cyprus Sport Organization, Open University of Cyprus for drafting codes of contact to prevent and combat harassment and sexual harassment. Furthermore, through media spots, victims of such behaviors are encouraged to break their silence and report the competent authorities. In the meantime, our office in cooperation with the Cyprus Academy of Police Administration has carried out a series of training seminars on the code of conduct about sexual harassment within, within the civil service with large numbers of civil services having been trained about their rights or responsibilities under the code. It must, it must also noted that after the commendation of my office, the public service law was amended by the parliament so that sexual harassment in the public sector is explicit, explicit, explicitly defined as a distinct disciplinary offense. That's what we had. And I hope that our today's meeting will inspire further ideas of how we can all cooperate on addressing gender-based violence in order to make our world a safer place for all women and girls. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Stylianum Lutidis, for that uh, very interesting, um, very interesting presentation on the role that can that the office of of the ombudsman can play, and uh, and for for laying out um, the the various possibilities, the various uh, um, uh, advantages that we have as as uh, as ombudsman in looking at and investigating cases, in being able to collect data, to focus on the kind of situations that come to us and that allow us eventually to draw um, important parallels. And I particularly like uh, your very positive presentation with regard to uh, the possibility of, of even um, initiating uh, criminal prosecutions that uh, to me is a, is a very exciting possibility, which, which I think is, is well worth um, that we all take down and note and, and, and work towards. And obviously being extremely positive in the work that we do in preparing codes of conduct, because after all, if we are to see ourselves as ombudsmen, as uh, quality controllers of public administration, that is a perfect place to begin to, to show that, that capacity and to lead by example, is to, to present them with codes of conduct. Um, and yes, that is that is a takeaway that I have from from your presentation, and uh, and also by this um, our awareness uh, and uh, and promotional capacity of uh, doing training um, sessions with with the public administration and being able to show them the things that that we have seen, the weaknesses we see, and where we can where we can go with this. Thank you very much. And um, uh, before we go to the next uh, to the next speaker, I just want to remind everybody that uh, any questions will be dealt with at the end of the session. So if you have specific questions, please note them down, send them to us. And uh, if they are specifically for any of the presenters, do uh, indicate that in uh, in your question, and we will call upon the the, the various pre presenters to to just um, to, to give us the answer or help us with the answer to the question. Thank you very much. And thank you once again, uh, uh, Honorable uh, uh, Maria. <laughs> it's, it's easier yes. for a my family, I guess. <laughs> thank you very much then. Can we now move to our um, third speaker? <clears throat> Honorable Grace Tikambenji Malera the respected uh, Ombudsman of Malawi, who will chart a path of prevention and awareness initiatives against gender-based violence and harassment. Um, just to uh, mention uh, to, to you, um, Honorable Grace uh, Tikambenja 
Benji, sorry, Malera, was appointed as Ombudsman of Malawi, effective from the 1st of September 2021. She is a lawyer and human rights expert with 20 years of work experience working with both state and non-state actors. She has worked across the governance sector in Malawi on a broad range of thematic areas, including human rights broadly, gender, gender and women's rights, children's rights, and access to justice. She holds a Bachelor of Law degree, LLB honors obtained from the University of Malawi, Chancellor College in 2002, and graduated from the University of the Free State Republic of South Africa with a master's degree in law in 2007. She was called to the Malawi Bar in 2002 to practice law in both the Supreme and High Courts of Malawi and in courts subordinate thereto. She has vast experience working with regional and international human rights mechanisms at the African Commission and United Nations levels respectively. She served as a member of the Special Law Commission on the Review of Electoral Laws from 2016 to 2017, as well, and is also a member of the Special Law Commission on the Development of the Trafficking in Persons Legislation. She is an exceptional human rights and gender advocate, architect of some NGOs working in governance, as well as, as in the advancement of women's rights in Malawi, and serves in a, on a number of boards of human rights NGOs in Malawi. She is passionate about using the law as a tool for social change and attainment of social justice and gender equality and social inclusion. In 2019, Grace was the moderator of Malawi presidential debate ahead of the 2019 Malawi tripartite elections. Honorable Grace, I call upon you to uh, take the floor. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Honorable Nikon, and um, thanks to Ioma for inviting me to, to be part of the presenters. I recognize the presence of all the distinguished um, participants in this webinar, all protocols observed. Um, I've been asked to zero in um, on the conversation today on the issue of um, prevention and awareness initiatives on gender-based violence and sexual harassment by ombudsman institutions. And um, I will quickly run through my 20, 20 slides. Um, the first are just introductory, but I think it's the last 10 slides where I will actually be um, talking about some of the strategies that um, have been put to use by ombudsman institutions to raise uh, awareness, but also to ensure that there's prevention of this um, scourge of gender-based violence and sexual harassment. Uh, by way of introduction, I just thought I could uh, share some quick thoughts with all of us. Um, this has been said by almost all the presenters in terms of um, the prevalence of, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be using the short forms for gender-based violence and sexual harassment, GBV and SH um, in our communities, in our homes, in our workplaces and in public life. And we also know it is a fact that uh, even though men and boys suffer from G suffer GBV and SH, it is more pronounced for women and girls, particularly the women that are excluded and marginalized. And it has been said by the other presenters that um, other factors such as race, social origin, sex um, do compound people's vulnerability to GBV and SH. And perhaps this is where in all our interventions, we must be looking at the intersectionality lens and also the multiple layers of, of discrimination that um, women and, and, and girls would be vulnerable to. Um, that said, I thought, you know, we could highlight this. Um, it's, I think it's not unique to the context that Malawi is probably the case in almost um, all the countries that are presented on this webinar. Um, women and girls are not safe from GBV and sexual harassment. And it doesn't matter your class and your level of education. We all are exposed to GBV and SH in our daily lives, in the home, you're walking and minding your business and somebody decides to body shame you on the street at school, especially for our um, young girls and even in churches at the hands of uh, 
those that should be providing care to us, the priests, the pastors, the bishops in workplaces, at the market, at the hospital, in the community and in public life, particularly in, 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 in politics. So this is a manifestation that there is obviously a lack of effective, efficient and responsive mechanisms to prevent and respond to GBV and SH at the various levels. And I thought this is where we as ombudsman's institutions come in, given mostly the constitutional mandates that we have. Um, I'm aware that perhaps some may not have constitutional mandates, but we almost, all of us almost have um, some legal framework within which we operate. So um, on the basis of um, those quick facts, I'll quickly, uh, provide some definitions that I adopted for this presentation for GBV and SH, and then uh, the, what we understand as the causes uh, categorized into cultural and institutional causes. I think this is very important. Uh, my 22 years experience is that um, half the time, especially having worked with NGOs, we have spent our prevention and response efforts on the manif manifestations and the, sympt the, the symptoms um, of GBV and SH without really going to the root causes, without really going structural and address the underlying factors that actually reinforce. So I think I'll spend a little bit of time on that uh, since I'm talking about prevention. And, um, and then I'll, I'll wrap up my presentation by, by just sharing some of the strategies that have proven to work um, in the issue of prevention and awareness on, on um, GBV and SH. Um, my fellow presenters have already uh, taken a bit of time to explain why we as ombudsman's institutions are very critical um, given our mandate to receive grievances against government officials, agencies, and to handle complaints relating to issues of um, service delivery. And I think this is where our critical role um, is centered. Um, we have a role to handle my administration uh, grievances. And um, GBV and um, SH usually occur due to systems that are, have broken down, systems that are not responsive, um, the social norms that underpin some of these things. How, for example, a woman that has gone to complain, to, to make a, a complaint on rape is treated as at the police station, particularly if their complaint uh, shows that they were out at night by 9 p.m. Immediately they make that fact known there are already some, some norms that are going to underpin how probably that police officer is going to respond to them. What is a good woman doing out at 10 p.m.? So it's those uh, systems that we must speak to when we are talking about prevention. I think later on, I'll talk about gender transformative approaches. If we do not underpin our prevention efforts in gender transformative approaches, we are going to spend all our resources, but without necessarily addressing the structural causes. Um, so um, you allow me to skip uh, the, my slides on what gender-based violence is, what sexual harassment is, because um, the, two, the first two presentations that really unpack the, these concepts, but I put them there for further reading when, when the presentations have been um, shared. Some quick facts here, gender-based violence and sexual harassment are violations of human rights and a life-threatening life health and protection issue. I think this has come from UNHCR. Gender-based violence and SH can happen between opposite sex or within same sex. I think the last part uh, is worth emphasizing. When we are packaging our prevention messages, we have done so with uh, underlying assumptions. And mostly, I think we have looked at um, heterosexual you know, relationships where gender-based violence is happening or where sexual harassment is happening. We have... Um, 
not really uh, put our attention to the fact that even within the same sex relationships, gender based violence is happening. And in most of our jurisdictions, there's some level of criminalization of issues around same sex relationships. So, how do we package our prevention messages that they reach these hard to reach communities? I think is a critical question that we must all be answering. Um, I'm, I'm saying this, I'm thinking of actually activities that are happening in Malawi right now in Uganda, where I think homophobia is even um, taking center stage. Uh, both males and females can either be victims or offenders, and GBV and this age disproportionately affects uh, women and girls. The World Bank estimates that one in three women will experience some form of physical violence. Um, I think it was um, Dr. Prof. Janini's um, presentation that has also looked so much into the causes of GBV um, and SH. They are institutional, they can be cultural, they can be structural, they can be underpinned by social norms, beliefs, traditions. And I think um, this, this um, cuts across all cultures, really, where when you look at the various social norms that tend to reinforce um, subjection of, of uh, people to GBV and SH. The cultures may be different, but for as long as there's the patriarchal underpinnings, we find that, um, you know, insubordination of women knows no place. Um, the inferiorization of women knows no context. It may take place in different forms and manifestation. And hence um, the high prevalence of GBV against um, women and girls. Um, we know there are social, economic, political, and environmental factors that also can affect or exacerbate the vulnerability of uh, people to GBV and SH. And I think this is very critical as the institution ombudsman when we design our prevention and the response mechanisms to actually contextualize them, to understand what are the social factors that are peculiar to our context that would uh, predispose people. You know, uh, for Africa, particularly speaking for Malawi, and you, we, we are looking at issues of poverty, we are looking at issues of uh, precarious unemployment levels. Um, so how do we come in to make sure that there's maybe equal opportunity and access to the job market by all the genders, by people in the rural areas? Economic factors um, also exacerbate uh, people's vulnerability, political factors and uh, environmental factors. Um, I'm, I'm skipping my introductory slides because much of this has already been uh, highlighted by the previous speakers. I thought we could take time to also understand them. You know, why get preoccupied with GBV and SH? Uh, we needed to also understand the effects of GBV at the individual level, at the community level, at the national level. It enhances inequalities. It uh, drives people into further impoverished situations. At the individual level, there are issues of stress disorder, depression, which may affect even our um, productivity in the workplace and other psychological effects. And then the most extreme cases, I think the example that um, um, Honorable Lotid was just giving about uh, somebody being driven to commit suicide because of a non-responsive system where they had been perpetually subjected to GBV. I think this is why as ombudsman institutions, we really need to, be purposeful, be deliberate about uh, streamlining issues of GBV and sexual harassment in our responsive packages. So how does this look like? Um, what strategies have been employed or could be employed? So I speak to some of the strateg strategies for prevention using our own experiences in Malawi, but also you know, broad experience from, from other institutions. Um, Ombudsman is, as ombudsman institutions, it's already been said, we have the mandate to conduct systemic investigations. And I think for some of our institutions, they can carry out these systemic investigations on own motion. What I am uh, propagating here is that we need to be purposeful about these systemic investigations because they do give us the latitude of looking at trends and saying, we want to, sub to focus on this subject matter. Unlike 
you know, complaints driven investigations where people have to come to you to register complaints. Um, for systemic investigations, you'd look at the trends and you make a decision to say, we are going to focus on this particular matter. And in that decision-making process, issues of GBV, issues of SH need to be prioritized um, to ensure that from that, we can interrogate the capacities, the effectiveness and the responsiveness of the institutions in our countries that are mandated to provide prevention and response services to GBV, and SH. So what I'm seeing here is we are not necessarily, you know, providing first line service on GBV and SH. We are looking at the systems. We are going structural to be able to, to, to make recommendations and directives to the Ministry of Gender, you know, to the Ministry of Justice, just like um, Cyprus was sharing the recommendations they made for criminal prosecution. I think that's a very critical entry point for us to be purposeful. I'll share an example there where we did carry out a systemic investigation on maternal health services um, some five years ago. Our report is available on our website. It's called Woos of the Womb, um, primarily because they were doing preventable operations where women uteruses were being removed needlessly. And a woman going to, to check in for maternal service, if you have um, something to do with your uterus, you know, the recommendation would be hypertrosectomy um, without considering other options. So from that systemic investigations, we did make critical policy and, uh, and, and, and the program based strategic recommendations and directives, and they're being implemented as we speak. So these systemic in investigations could also lead us to making recommendations that would strengthen in institutional frameworks and um, on GBV and SH safeguards. Uh, Janine talked about this. We have that whole strong body of international laws. How are they reflected in the domestic setups? Um, we could also make recommendations on review and enactment of laws and policies. We could question issues around accessibility, affordability, and acceptability of services particularly in relation to responding to victims or survivors of GBV and, 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 and SH. We can interrogate issues of access to justice. Um, so the, this is what a whole range of activities that we can do to contribute to the prevention of GBV. Um, I also think that as ombudsman institutions, we have to incorporate GBV and SH within our core functions by explicitly putting GBV and SH in the organizational documents such as uh, our strategic plans. So for the Malawi Ombudsman, our current strategic plan for 2022 to 2027 has a specific goal on um, gender and social inclusion. We want to be deliberate. Why? Because we did um, a trends analysis of our own, uh, complaints returns. We found that uh, for a period of uh, close to five years, uh, the complaints that were being brought by women and the other excluded categories would be around 15% of uh, our annual case returns. So that told us we needed to reach out to those groups. So very important there. And also have clear and elaborate, elaborative strategies within institutions on GBV and SH prevention and tracking and monitoring is also critical. So that's uh, a news paper item that appeared in our one of our local papers where we are out there and telling the message as it is that we are here for gender and social inclusion and we're actually putting deliberate measures to package even our civic education um, awareness mechanism um, products to, to, to sensitize women that, you know, if you are facing sexual harassment in the workplace, that is my administration and um, the ombudsman can assist with that. So we are taking those deliberate steps. Um, uh, these are all outward looking steps that we can take. We need to, uh, at a broader level, we need to continue investing in women and girls, particularly in education. Uh, I think a lot of statistics surveys show that um, uh, for poor women in, in the rural areas, they tend to face the multiple discrimination. I, I talked about exacerbating their vulnerability to GBV. Uh, getting men and boys involved. There's a whole lot of debate around this that we cannot finish in one day. But I think a lot of GBV has also come 
as a, a um, countering the efforts that we are doing because we have not involved men and boys enough. Uh, supporting GBV survivors could lead to prevention, particularly of repeat uh, subject and subjection to GBV. I talked about implementing gender transformative awareness raising activities and also addressing the social, economic, political and, uh, inequality. Strategies for GBV uh, and SH prevention that we can put in place in our own institutions. Uh, the first slides I was talking about is uh, strategies to work with others, but how about internally? What is it that we can do? Number one, we need to have offices that provide grievance, grievance handling mechanisms for GBV and SH. So obviously, for example, the starting point would be for all of us to take a look at our institutions and um, check if, for example, we have code, codes of conduct that would prescribe the sexual harassment in the workplace, if we actually have sexual um, anti-sexual policies in our workspaces, and how much influencing we are doing so that uh, our ministries, our departments and agencies would actually have those policies. So for the complaints that we are hearing, for the inquiries that we are making, touching on SH, are we able to make a general recommendation to a particular ministry, to a particular department, to actually put in place an, a sexual harassment policy and make sure that it is effective? Um, we need to have effective handling and remedying of um, reported and observed instances of GBV and SH. I think much of the repeat subjection of people to SH also stems from the fact that um, we would probably have so many cases that would not be handled effectively, um, leading to a sort of culture of impunity where you know, perpetrators of SH, for example, in the workplace, know that they can get away with it anyway. So our systems must be seen to be providing um, appropriate remedies and communication of the remedial actions, um, holding GBV and SH offenders um, accountable, mainstreaming GBV and SH issues in our systemic investigations, like I talked about. Right now, we are doing a systemic investigation in Malawi Ombudsman on a program called the Affordable Input Subsidy Program. This is where government provides a seed and fertilizer to farmers. And um, to cover the whole country, you can imagine it, it takes people on um, queuing for days on end without receiving the commodities. There are issues of people receiving coupons. So within that kind of context, there is um, uh, it, it raises issues of transactional sex where, you know, a woman that's left home three days, six children back home would want to be assisted faster and would succumb to sexual demands. So we picked this in our investigative reports from the media and we are actually focusing on that so that we can make appropriate recommendations. Even though when you see this um, systemic investigation, it was, it was a on a purely agricultural issue, but we are working on um, streamlining the gender lens into it. We also need to train our staff um, on how to work with victims or survivors of GBV discrimination. I think this is a special class. It's not your everyday complainant. Um, this is a complainant who is saying, I went to the hospital for this particular service and um, I was uh, sexually abused by medical personnel. I need assistance. Are our personnel trained to deal with that person, to deal with the tra trauma they're going through? Are our personnel trained to make the relevant referrals? This person probably needs psychological help. Do we have the network? Do we have the referral me mechanism handy at the level? And what kind of questions would we be asking that kind of a uh, complainant? to avoid subjecting them to further trauma. So there are all these issues that I think we cannot keep taking on face value. We must be deliberate to train ourselves on these issues. We need in, to set up gender sensitive complaints. I think uh, uh, Janine already talked about issues of confidentiality, you know, uh, around issues of uh, providing that safe environment we are concerned. Um, I learned on a program that I was implementing on uh, um, gender-based violence um, in, in the past years, that even we ourselves, uh, on that program, they asked me to recruit a consultant um, psychosocial counselor. So I said, for who? They said, for you, Grace, and your staff. I said, but why? 
we are not the ones that will be coming with issues. They said, yes, after listening to all the stories and everything, you begin to, 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 to uh, have signs for secondary trauma. So you also need to, to be, if you need be, to be provided. So are those mechanisms available? And um, could we also look into setting up specific departments, unit or desk officers uh, for these issues? My last slide is um, again, zeroing in on uh, civic education awareness raising. Number one is for us to be deliberate to mainstream issues of GBV and SH in our civic education manuals and other IEC materials. When um, I was appointed, looking at the lower figure of um, the complaints that we're receiving um, uh, on, on these issues, I said, let us package information so that we are able to tell people, if you have a sexual harassment complaint with the police and you're not receiving the necessary um, assistance, the ombudsman can intervene and uh, assist so that, that that process is much more responsive. And um, I think one classical example is um, where we did make a referral of um, a case of rape in one of the hospitals through our hospital ombudsman mechanism to police. And because of our oversighting of that particular, just that one case, it was speedily investigated and speedily prosecuted, which you don't get every day in a context like Malawi. I, I think you'd spend five years, six years, you know, you know, a victim or a survivor going through the criminal justice system until you get a conviction. So those are some of the roles that we can do to create that responsive environment, which ultimately then would see um, um, lesser cases. We also need to intensify use of community-based structures. Um, in Malawi, we are employing community radios um, as a platform where we can reach out to the lowest level of our societies. Promotional activities, um, research capacity building are some of the activities mandates that we have. We should also consider how messages on women's rights, GBV, can be mainstreamed into our promotion activities and um, collaborate with civil society and other governmental partners in these institutions. Uh, I'll end by highlighting the critical role of monitoring, evaluation and impact assessment. Let's keep looking at the number of cases that women report to us and we can be deliberate by going to them. In Malawi, we call them mobile accountability clinics where we are not operating from the city. We are going to the villages, um, demand creation and then getting the complaints from them. We need to keep a track of the number of GBV related cases that we are recording the level of understanding, the noticeable gender insistive administrative practices, increased trends of cases reported um, in the media to the police. We will be able to use all of these issues to then make specific recommendations. In conclusion, I am saying that ombudsman institutions have a unique entry point as um, people that are handling my administration uh, of state administration as catalysts of redress for citizens uh, when their rights have been violated through state inaction, ineffectiveness, indifference, and non-responsiveness. It is incumbent upon all of us to work with all stakeholders to discern and address patterns of injustice based on these inefficiencies. In the work of high prevalence of GBV, uh, we need to even be more vigilant. We should leverage on our constitutional access to parliament, to decision makers, to make sure that we actually, you know, are not just rhetoric about these issues. We have policies, we have strategic plans, we have Ministry of Genders, Gender Machinery, uh, Gender Equality Commissions, but um, you wake up and you don't, a day doesn't pass without um, reading issues of um, gruesome GBV cases being committed in the communities. We need to, I think, work on that disconnect between what is in the law and uh, what is in our policies and what we can contribute. I will stop here, uh, Honorable Nico, and uh, thank you so much for the kind attention to have from everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Grace, for that. Um, thank you for that, that insight and the, the overlap I see with, uh, with the presentation of, of Honorable Maria was, was excellent because it is more um, more detail of, of where we can go with regard to strategies. And I particularly like 
um, your your proposal to bring in the strategies uh, that help us as ombudsmen also uh, create the space within our own institutions to take care of the issues of, of gender-based violence and not just hold it at arm's length um, with regard to the, to the, the, the general um, complaints uh, mechanism that we have, but we also have to make arrangements within in, in house. Um, I was just uh, having a having a quick um, a quick laugh here at my end because I have an all female uh, office, so um, the gender based gender based issues are, are are a little absent to us or a little foreign to us, but uh, but we do we do need to make the space obviously for this um, for the future. Now um, I think uh, particularly. Uh, the, the internal procedures are what I take away from that and how and how we also need our own institutions to have internal procedures before we can go out there and uh, make those recommendations to to the the general administration um, to which we're all we're all uh, uh, attached and we have to have to deal with and um, particularly the, the the various points that you have, that you have raised as to how to do this. Um, I don't want to repeat all of them, but uh, but there is the there is the blueprint uh, between the three speakers. Again, um, there are uh, wonderful op opportunities for us as as ombudsmen to go home and go uh, and review our entire processes, check our countries also with regard to to our countries and to our international obligations and to think of how we can uh, move this particular agenda forward. Um, I want to uh, thank you all again, and thank you, uh, Honorable Grace, the last speaker, and, and the three speakers before you. Before we go into the question answer uh, uh, process, I see we have exactly 20 minutes left. Um, we will take up 15 minutes at least uh, with the questions and answers. Um, I'm not quite sure how we're going to deal with this, but because I see we do have a lot of questions. There have been uh, a number that have, uh, that have already been sent out to us and we have a lot that have come in so that I haven't not necessarily followed. So I will call on, on uh, Marion to help me, Marion and, and, uh, and Frankie, to, uh, to help me through uh, some of the questions because I, I had my eye elsewhere at the time that the questions were coming in. But um, I, I, I see that amongst the questions that we've, we have some very practical questions about, about statistics, for example. Um, I'm not too sure that we can give the answers to this directly. So I would probably retra retain, retrain, sorry, refrain from um, uh, pushing you along, along those lines, because much of this would have to be before we can talk about global register of uh, for sexual offenders, for example, and the statistics, what statistics are we talking about? Are we talking about national statistics? And if so, which, which of the countries? We are 47 countries represented around this, uh, this webinar and, uh, and already quite a few, uh, three countries at least with, uh, with the presenters. So um, what I propose to do is, uh, is is look at some of the questions that I believe you could um, you could perhaps uh, consider answering uh, at this point. If I can just uh, bear with me. Um, I'm not seeing that. Um, right. I have I have one question. Um, what measures can be put in place to address the problem of gender-based violence by agencies promoting ombudsman policies, especially psychological violence? Um, I don't know if any one of you uh, feels that you you are in a position to answer that, and when, and we can be uh, we we can assist this um, this uh, person from Uganda actually who's who's interested in this question. Honourable Grace, uh, would you like to try and answer that, or sorry, yes. did, you, um, did you miss thanks, the question? Um, yes, um, assuming I've understood the question correctly, um, 
my take would be number one um every context would, would have to decide you know um how we want public service delivery to be more responsive to the needs of survivors when it comes to issues of psychological violence because it's the most subtle one um physical violence you will present to the police maybe with a cut a blue eye and that they're able to say what happened if they've been trained. Psychological violence, you really need those professionals to bring it out. So as ombudsman's institutions, it's the area of systemic investigation we talked about where we ourselves must also understand when we are saying we are integrating GBV into our, uh, our systemic investigations, how does it manifest and be sure to tackle all forms of gender-based violence and be sure to then interrogate how the system is, is um, responding to the different forms of violence and make recommendations. I'll give an example of Malawi, for example. Um, I don't think we even have um, sufficient, you know, psychological healthy facilities, number one. Number two, our context, our, our women sometimes do not even in themselves comprehend that what I'm going through now is psychological violence because of the normalization and everything. So how do we then take all of these from a research-based point of view, from an evidence point of view and present them, push for more psychological facilities, psychological health facilities to be opened? Uh, in Malawi, most of them would be private. Is that accessible to the ordinary poor Malawian? So I would see our role as being a catalyst for policy. Um, um, related recommendations that we can make around some of these issues. And then in partnership with civil society organizations, human rights commissions and others, maybe to make sure that uh, the awareness raising is also tackling uh, these issues, including psychological violence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to uh, end that? Honorable Maria or, or Dr. Hicks, would you uh, wish to add to that or is... Um... Um, yes, thanks. If I can come in then, and and really thank you, Grace. I think you've given such a wonderful slate of really pragmatic and practical measures. If if I were a public protector or an ombudsman in a country, I'd pretty much have been taking photographs of your slides and thinking this is something we could implement back home. What I would like to suggest, and I, I see also there was a question around you know, people who are vulnerable to extortion, so migrant or refugee stakeholders um, who, because of their social context, are vulnerable to not only state failures to protect and respond to them when the instances of gender-based violence, but experiencing sexual harassment and gender-based violence at the hands of state officials themselves. So when, you, when you're talking about these forms of the psychological impact, I think a starting point for officers is to understand what are the state obligations. What does a good country response to gender-based violence look like? What is, you know, as I'd outlined the, the international legislative framework, what are the components? What is domestic violence? What is sexual harassment and gender-based violence? Have we, through our own national policy and legislation, identified all the different forms of gender-based violence and domestic violence, including um, psychosocial forms of, of violence? And what kinds of programs and policies have has our government put in place? And tracking, Grace, you speak about tracking the effectiveness of those programs and its implementation. So I think for officers of ombudsman to understand the sector of gender-based violence and understand what legislation and programs by the state should look like is, is key. So that through your um, systemic investigations, you can assess the effectiveness of, of state response. Um, but the second thing that Honorable Grace said that I think is key is this, and having come from um, in institutions supporting democracy um, and you know, these independent state institutions myself, is to recognize the importance of collaboration between your office and civil society. Um, we so often have one office in a district or in an urban center. Um, it is so vital that we tap into civil society networks. So whether it's gender and women's networks or rural movements, um, women on farms, for, in for instance, that we tapping into civil society because it's there where those 
challenges and those barriers are surfaced by organizations working on the ground, which is where we cannot be with our offices, and then utilizing the leverage that our office can bring, as you say, to access parliament um, or to demand state accountability and response. Um, so that is all I would add to that. But thank you, Grace, for those very wonderful mentions. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hicks. Um, I, I see a, a, a question, a very specific question also that's come up. Um, what is being done to address those who have not received justice from a system that lets perpetrators run free? Rapists get off from criminal prosecution on the basis of a technicality, and this feeds into an already skewed ju ju sorry, <laughs> justice system. Um, this is this is something also that I've that I have had uh, I've had experience with here at, in my office. I I have received uh, um, uh, recently uh, a complaint from a member of staff who uh, alleges a sort of um, sexual harassment, really, from from a, a very senior member of of um, of that institution. And uh, and it's been one of those one of those very awkward cases where um, the pressure on the police has only produced um, a, a incomplete file, if you like, a, a, an evidence empty file. And and the short answer to the to the question of what are you doing about this is nothing, because there's no evidence. Um, and this is a sort of it's it's. Um, it's an open secret that this is this conduct is is ongoing has happened before in this in the same institution and uh, and my office feels so totally my my own staff are convinced that that this is the reality it's it's true and it's correct but what do you do in cases like that so there is this impunity that continues and that we we all feel totally um, unable to deal with and un, uh, completely, uh, we have no idea of, of how to take it forward. I think this is something that would I, I'd like to hear you on, and I'm, I think it, it's what this question is about in particular. Um, Honourable uh, Honourable Maria, would you like to answer that that one? Um, I think uh, it's along the lines of the work that you've done. Also, perhaps you can assist us on this. Yes, I think that. When there is a jurisprudence on this uh, subject matter, uh, there is not a lot we can do and in, intervene. You know, is the is the judgment of the courts, and uh, so we cannot intervene in any way. We are not allowed to intervene. We have not the competence, and uh, when there is um, uh, the judgment after the judgment, you know, so. Um, we recognize that there are so many difficulties and difficulties and inequalities and, uh, and an unfair treatment to these victims, but there are not much we can do on this subject matter, unfortunately. But we can intervene generally uh, to the police in order to investigate properly and uh, bring the cases before the court um, more. Um, in more uh, efficient way in order mm. to succeed and have a better judgment. It's the only way we can uh, uh, intervene. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could I possibly jump in there with, with a suggestion because I believe that there is greater space for greater policy advocacy from your sector. Um, because I think if your statistics are revealing systemic failures by the justice system, this is administrative failures, systemic mm -hmm. failures by the justice system to secure conviction and redress for victims and survivors. I think there could be, you know, that would be something you could engage your legislature on, that we have sexual offenses legislation, but our courts are letting us down. We don't have prosecutors who, who are trained in prosecuting on sexual offenses cases. How about creating, as we have in South Africa, we have sexual offences courts. Let's have specific courts that are established to deal with sexual offences cases. Let's have specially trained prosecutors. Let's have let's advocate for training of our judicial officers so that we have gender sensitive 
um, presiding officers over court cases who don't make revolting judgments that really replicate the kind of norms and attitudes that we see within our societies. Um, you know, and as well as take up systemic investigative failures by police. Um, if police officers are not bringing the necessary evidence to courts for a prosecutor to obtain a conviction, that's a failure in an administrative justice system. And I believe that that is something, you know, through your role, both through bringing such matters to the attention of parliamentarians, you can advocate and demand um, better responses and training and resourcing of police officers. Um, so I, I really think this is an area where you could make a, a powerful impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Honorable Graceler, did you want to, to add anything to that? Yes, uh, Honorable Nicole, just a quick one. I was going to say that uh, that gap is also where our partnerships and collaboration would come in handy. So I would, I would illustrate that by a case where um, some two years ago, our men in uniform, the police officers, you know, in going to um, come a rioting community, a demonstration, um, they molested women, some were actually raped. As you can imagine, I think it also had some political connotations around it. And uh, the police were reluctant to even open an investigation docket because uh, it was their own that had done it. That's where our associations came in handy. The Malawi Women's Lawyers Association took up the case for private prosecution, for uh, civil litigation, uh, representing the women. They have since been compensated by the state. And I think the prosecution is ongoing and has been transferred. The investigation has been transferred to our newly established Independent Complaints Commission. So you can see the kind of referral pathways that um, as an ombudsman office, you'd be aware of, and you sh we should be able to say, we I think this is best. This institution is best placed to take up the matter, but we have we need to have referral systems where you are keeping sight of what is going on to the logical conclusion of the cases. So I, I think collaboration would come in handy in addition to what Dr. Janina said about going systemic and exposing these uh, structural failures and uh, making policy recommendations around them. Thank you. Thank you. I lost myself here. Wow. What do you want? Wow. Where am I? Bear with me, I've just lost myself. <laughs> as long as I don't cut myself. Where am I? I've gone to Zoom. These guys. Oh dear, I've lost myself. If I close it, I might close the thing now. I can't find myself. <laughs> Took like a big long I don't know. Honorable Nicole, just while you're looking, there's a question about sexual harassment in the workplace um, that are typically subtle, accompanied by abuse of power and masculinity, and how can this be handled? I think a useful starting place um, I gave reference to the ILO Convention on Violence and Harassment in the World of Work. And I believe that this is something that public protectors can do is to assess whether or not at a country level, um, your state has enacted, has domesticated its obligations in terms of this ILO convention, or in, you know, in any regard, if you if you're not signatory to this convention, in terms of your own discrimination legislation at a country level, sexual harassment in the workplace is gender-based discrimination, um, and I think it's important to ensure that you've got a legislative framework that deals with sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace um, that requires companies to put in place reporting mechanisms um, to ensure we've had cases come through our courts in South Africa where accordingly 
because it's an inequality and discrimination related issue, that if employers have failed to enact a mechanism for reporting sexual harassment in the workplace, or have failed to take action against um, harassers or abusers in the workplace, that an employer, that company itself can be found guilty um, in terms of its vicarious liability, its obligation to provide and create a safe place for workers for failing to do so. So we've had court orders, court orders that have found companies um, guilty um, of, of having failed to enact measures um, and, and they attract then that liability um, for failing to address sexual harassment. So you need that strong legislative framework um, to give you um, that leverage point to hold employers accountable for addressing sexual harassment in the workplace, because it is fundamentally discrimination and violation of workers' rights. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for that uh... For that bit of advice, and certainly uh, it's it's something we will take very seriously. Because yes, I I, I do appreciate, and, and I think this brings us also perhaps to the wrapping up. I'm not sure we can uh, we, we have any more time to take any further questions. Um, Marion, do you is there any particular burning question that needs to be considered whilst we have uh, the platform that we do have, the very very interesting and useful platform we have. Uh, Honorable Nicole, I, I think um, time is running out. The interpreters it uh, need to leave. So what we will do, we will send the questions through to the panelists and if they don't mind responding to them and then what we, we will post them on the website when we will be posting all the other documents relating to the webinar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, with that, uh, I will I will wrap up this session um, by first of all thanking uh, our speakers, the three speakers who have taken time out of their busy schedule to spend with us and to give us such interesting and invaluable information, which um, we willingly and I think I I think I speak on behalf of all the other ombudsmen that who attended and their staff who attended this session today. Um, for the invaluable insight this has all been to us and the homework that it gives us, because it does give us a lot of work to do in uh, on this, this subject, which I must admit, um, when I first read, I felt to be a little distant and 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 that I say, I say with in all in all humbleness, but in, in all humility, because I I am ashamed now to have to say it, but I think it needs to be said that I actually believe that well this sort of subject doesn't really concern the ombudsman, but I do realize now that I was completely wrong. And it's only when I sat down and, and, and gave more serious thought to it that I realized I had the case that I didn't know what to do with. And I've been seeing, and of course we've all seen what um, the, 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 the international football, the women's football scene uh, brought to us, uh, even if the elephant in the room wasn't mentioned, but it's still, it's still a very a very pertinent subject and it gives a lot of room for, for reflection. So um, my uh, thanks to the, the speakers this morning, uh, this afternoon for me, um, is particularly with regard to the amount of material that you've given us to work on. Mm -hmm. And we have absolutely no excuse not to do the work now and not to rethink our entire pro um, approach to the question of, uh, of gender-based violence and harassment. And uh, again, each speaker has led us through um, the uh, audit process that we need to carry out uh, within our institutions, within our, na our national context also. And of course, I come back to where I started with um, the role that we we can all play and that we play as ombudsmen uh, because we have we are this famous catalyst for 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 redress we uh, can make visible and political and legitimate expectations of fairness come alive for people and we have this strong moral voice and the um the jurisdiction and <clears throat> the uh, defined powers that will allow us to be able to make this happen. So um, our message as we leave this uh, seminar, this webinar this afternoon, 
is to take all this knowledge with us, to take this entire mandate that we have, which is an extremely strong mandate, to turn it into something that is, will become more positive for the 50% of the world, which is uh, women, and um, ensure that we can all play, that the 100% uh, of humanity can play their full role in a, trying to achieve the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. Once again, I'd like to thank um, the organizers of the, of, uh, the webinar. Um, uh, in this case, it's uh, AOMA working with, uh, it's AO, AORC working with, um, our, through our, AOMA, uh, Ombudsman Association of African uh, Ombudsmen and Mediators. And I'd also like to thank all those uh, participants across Africa who have attended with us and um, the, those coming from further afield. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for your, for your time and for your participation and the support and uh, wish everybody a, ha a happy ending of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank and you I would much. like to say thank you. Thank you. Thank I'd like to just say a final thank you as well on behalf of a York. So to thank everybody for joining us. We valued your then heartfelt gratitude to everyone who has made this event a success. Uh, the speakers have provided illuminating insights, shedding light on legal frameworks and pivotal role of ombudsman institutions and innovative prevention initiatives necessary to combat gender-based violence and harassment. We sincerely thank Professor Shannon Bosch of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, who represented the Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Head of the College of Law and Management Studies, Advocate Kaleka Galeka and as well, the Acting Public Protector of South Africa and Acting Chairperson of the York Board for their warm welcome and introductions. A heartfelt thanks go to you, Honorable Nicole, for skillfully, skillfully moderating the discussion and ensuring the seamless flow of the webinar. We extend gratitude to our speakers, Dr. Janine Hicks, Senior Lecturer of the school, at the School of Law, University of KwaZulu-Natal, Ombudsman, um, uh, sorry, Honorable Stiliano Lotidis, Ombudsman of Cyprus, and Honorable Grace Tikambenji Malera, Ombudsman of Malawi. Your contributions have enriched our understanding of the challenges in addressing gender-based violence and harassment, offering valuable solutions and perspectives. Your, high, your insights underscore the vital role that Ombudsman institutions play in this context and provide a path forward. A special mention of thanks goes to Ms. Hazel Langer of the UKZN Corporate Relations Office and her team, whose behind the scenes efforts have been integral to the success of this event. Uh, to the participants, your, your presence sign uh, signifies a commitment to women's safety, empowerment and dignity. Your questions and contributions have deepened our discussions and your in uh, engagement is appreciated. We hope the knowledge shared during this webinar will serve you well in, in future endeavors. Uh, we also wish to acknowledge and appreciate the interpreters whose valuable service has made this webinar accessible to all. And we just thank you for the Conclude, let's carry forward the knowledge and inspiration gained today. Together, let's be agents of change, advocating for a world free from gender-based violence and harassment. We aspire to a society where everyone can live without fear and reach their full potential. Please note that uh, the York team will post the recording, the presentations, related documents, and external links on the AYOMA York website within the next week. We encourage you to revisit and share this content with your colleagues. Um, this topic needs all the exposure it can get. Once again, thank you everybody for being part of this event. We eagerly anticipate your presence in our upcoming webinars. Goodbye and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye